Hello everyone. I would like to say a few words about the next computer assignment, assignment number five. Um, I've already uh, brought up the slides for that lab here in another application, so let's jump into those. Um, this lab talks about a uh, signal processing operation referred to as the Hilbert transform. And uh, what I'd like to do is just sort of talk through uh, as quickly as possible uh, the slides associated with this lab. Um, so we'll talk about uh, the Hilbert transform. We'll talk about the um, envelope of a signal and its phase, which can be obtained from the Hilbert transform of the signal. We'll need to talk about phase unwrapping just briefly. Um, I'll introduce the concept of instantaneous frequency, and then we'll get into the assignment. So the Hilbert transform is a filtering operation. So um, all you need is to know what the impulse response is, and then you can implement this filter using code that you've already written. The input signal to the transform X could be either real or could be a complex signal, could be pure imaginary. Um, but the output is always a complex signal, and we'll see why that's the case. There'll be, there's actually two filtering operations involved. One is uh, a, a filter called the Hilbert filter. We'll denote its impulse response by H of n. The other is a pure delay filter. We'll call it D, sub D of n. And um, let's take a look at uh, how these are arranged uh, to create this Hilbert transform. So here's a block diagram. Again, we've got the input signal X. It comes in here and it's delayed through the filter D. And it's also processed through this Hilbert filter H. Um, we can either add these together or subtract them, uh, leading to two possible outputs. Uh, one is Y plus, one is Y minus. Notice that the Hilbert filter branch is multiplied by a J. So um, let's suppose the input signal is real. Essentially, the delayed signal here is the um, a just a pure delayed version of the input signal. So the real part of the output is just a delayed version of the input. And the imaginary part of the output is um, the Hilbert processed version of the input. Um, down below, you can see uh, sort of a convolution representation of this uh, parallel cascade of two systems explained in two different ways. The, and really the difference between these two, uh, we, we've got X convolved with either D plus J times H or D minus J times H. Um, okay, let's look at the frequency response of this combined operation. And again, because we can either add or subtract the responses, or, or these two channels, we get two different kinds of responses. So, so uh, let's, let's take a look at the case where we add the outputs of these two filters together. When we add, uh, we get a, a frequency response that looks like this. Notice that it's zero for negative frequencies and is, has a gain of one for positive frequencies. Alternatively, if we subtract, we get a gain of one for negative frequencies and, and zero for positive frequencies. So this acts like a filter that cuts off negative frequencies or positive frequencies depending on whether you add or subtract. Um, if you go through and calculate the impulse response, let's suppose we're going to use this uh, plus version up here. If you calculate the impulse response of, this fil of the Hilbert filter that's needed, uh, you'd find that you get this uh, form here, a sine squared over n. Now, <clears throat> um, if we'll, we'll talk a, f a little bit more about the impulse responses of the delay filter and the Hilbert filter in a few minutes. But um, just for the time being, I want to point out that um, here, here I've plotted the, the, the impulse response of the delay filter and the impulse response of the Hilbert filter. And um, you can see from the form of the impulse response for the Hilbert filter, notice that the numerator here is an even function because we have sine, which is an odd function, but we square it. That becomes an even function of n. And we're dividing by a linear function, which is an odd function of n. So even divided by odd gives you an odd function. And we see that odd symmetry in the impulse response. Notice that it um, has odd symmetry about its midpoint right here, sample number 15. And um, where that 
uh, impulse response, the, the point of symmetry um, for the Hilbert filter is also the same sample where the delay filter has its um, this Kronecker delta. Both of these filters, as we'll study later in the course, have a delay of 15 samples. Um, we'll talk about that more later. Let's look at the a practical um, version of the frequency response. Notice that these are ideal frequency responses, but you can't actually implement those in real life. Um, this would be something that is implementable. This is a practical frequency response for the delay filter. These are magnitude responses. Notice that it passes everything, attenuates nothing. Um, whereas the Hilbert filter, you know, does have these bands, these transition bands where it rolls off from a gain of one down to uh, uh, basically a zero crossing in the magnitude response. So um, the next picture is the same thing but displayed on a dB scale instead of a linear scale. And then when we add and subtract and show the combined response of the two systems as a parallel cascade, you can see that um, we get a gain of 1 over most of the positive frequencies, a gain of 0 over most of the negative frequencies. But there are um, these narrow bands where we're transitioning from a pass band to a stop band. And that's unavoidable in real filters. These are linear magnitude responses. Here are the same things on a dB scale. And we've talked about this briefly already uh, as we looked at the frequency response, but what's the action of this Hilbert transform? Notice that when we use the plus sign in the transform, uh, we're passing positive frequency components and setting the negative frequencies to zero. And then we do the opposite if we use the negative sign. So here's a piece of MATLAB code that shows us how to design Hilbert transform filters. Um, I know I gave you the impulse response on that previous slide, but uh, this is the code that I would prefer that you use in MATLAB. Um, I'm not going to explain this very much uh, at the moment. Um, I just encourage you to use the code as you see here. And let's hop over to MATLAB just to illustrate this. So um, I'm going to show you a, a simple example. This example is, a, let, let's go with a little bit longer. Let's go with a 31 uh, tap or a length 31 um, Hilbert transformer. And um, if we look at the, um, the impulse response of that, uh, you can see the negative symmetry here. Well, I'll make a plot in just a minute. But what I wanted to do, actually, Let's go back to the 11 uh, sample case so that we can see the whole thing on one screen. OK, so here's the uh, impulse response of the Hilbert filter. So how do we create a delay filter that has the appropriate delay for this uh, Hilbert filter? So what we'd do is we'd say d is equal to 0, size h. So this is a vector um, that has um, the same length as h now. So now then all we need to do is set um, uh, the center tap to 1. In this case, that center tap is tap number 6. And now we can see that um, where the Hilbert filter has the 0 in the center, our delay filter has uh, an impulse at that location. So this is like a Kronecker delta. And when we convolve with this, uh, this is going to produce for us a delay of one sample, or I'm sorry, a delay in this case of 6 samples. And the but the point is that the delay through the del the delay filter is designed to match the delay through the Hilbert filter so that these signals at the outputs of the filters stay time aligned, and so we get the effect of a Hilbert transform. If we look at a um, stem plot of these two filters, the uh, blue that you see here is the delay filter, and then the orange is the Hilbert filter. OK, let's look at a longer version. The one that uh, is used in the lab is 321 samples long. And um, so we would say D, the center tap is going to be len plus 1 over 2. And if we do another stem, then we get this type of a response. 
And this, is, this shape is to be expected. Remember that um, the impulse response of the Hilbert filter is sine squared divided by n. And so you can see the 1 over n shaping that you would expect. And then also the, the sine squared uh, structure is embedded in here as the samples alternate between 0 and a non-zero value. OK. Let's go back to the slides. Uh, so we've talked about um, designing a delay filter and a corresponding Hilbert filter. <clears throat> I'll just mention here that applications of the Hilbert transform are many. Uh, they're used in radio receivers, radar receivers, single sideband modulation, medical instruments. Um, they can be used for <coughs> special effects in audio. Um, and we'll explore one of those later in this lab. Um, they can be used for all sorts of signal analysis. Um, it's interesting that uh, to consider the action of the Hilbert transform on just a pure cosine wave. If you put in cosine at a frequency omega, uh, then the output will be um, a complex exponential at the same frequency. So what the Hilbert filter does is it, it generates from the cosine coming in, it generates the corresponding sine component at the same frequency and when these are added together, you get um, a complex exponential. Similarly, if you put in uh, a, f a signal of the form uh, that's in terms of an amplitude times a cosine of some phase function, what comes out is the same amplitude times a complex exponential um, with that same phase. And now that we have uh, the signal in this form, this sort of a polar form, we're able to extract its magnitude and its phase. Whereas, if you try to extract magnitude and phase from, from the input signal x alone, from only the real part, um, you can't do it. So that's what the Hilbert transform is for. It's to extract magnitude and phase of a signal. Uh, once we have the phase, uh, we can calculate the instantaneous frequency. So for a, for a signal of this form, where you have a time-varying magnitude and a time-varying phase, uh, the instantaneous frequency is defined to be um, the negative derivative of the phase, and then you divide by 2 pi because our units are in um, hertz here. Uh, in discrete time, we can approximate that derivative using a first difference. And instead of a dt, we'll multiply by the sampling rate to account for the, uh, the, the difference uh, in time between these two samples. So we'll use this um, first difference approximation to the derivative to calculate the instantaneous frequency of signals that we're dealing with. And that's going to be a pretty good approximation, especially when the sampling rate is high. OK, now let's suppose that we take a signal x and we compute its Hilbert transform. The magnitude of the signal can be calculated by um, taking the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts at the output of the Hilbert transform. So remember, Hilbert transform, we've got, say, a real signal coming in, and we have two signals coming out. We have a real part on the top branch and the imaginary part on the bottom branch. So given those two signals, we can calculate the magnitude as the square root of the sum of the squares of the real and imaginary parts. And we can calculate the phase as the arctangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part. Um, I'll note that if you're writing this in C or in MATLAB, be sure to use a four-quadrant arctan function. In uh, math.h, there is a function called atan2 defined, and that's a four-quadrant arctangent. Now, even a four-quadrant arctangent returns a phase between, oh, I think it's between minus pi and pi, or something like that. But the phase phi um, is a continuous signal, so it's not necessarily restricted to be between minus pi and pi. So we have to go through an operation called phase unwrapping to basically um, peel apart the phase um, that gets wrapped uh, due to the arctangent function. 
basically remove that ambiguity. And th this uh, s uh, five steps of code here, if you put this in a for loop at the output of the Hilbert filter, this allows you to um, do the phase uh, unwrapping and the instantaneous frequency calculation all at the same time. So let's take a look at this code. So what we do first is we do an arctan2 um, four quadrant arctangent function, imaginary over real. Then we calculate the instantaneous frequency as the current phase minus the previous phase. Um, here I haven't uh, accounted for the scale factor fs over 2 pi, but we can do that later. And then um, what we need to do is check to make sure that the instantaneous frequency, if it's greater than pi, then what we'll do is we'll subtract um, 2 pi from the frequency. Um, that's the phase unwrapping step. And Or if it's uh, less than negative pi, we'll add 2 pi. And again, that's uh, the phase unwrapping. So, the, so we, we, we need to unwrap in both directions. Then we save the current phase into the old phase variable so that we can get ready for the next time around to process the next sample. Now if you wanted to resynthesize the signal, maybe using only the phase and not the amplitude, you could just do um, x of n equal cosine of this phase. <clears throat> so this, this would be an example of an audio effect where we've taken a signal and we've stripped off its amplitude, so we'll have a, a different uh, maybe more of a robotic sound to it um, because it's been stripped of its amplitude. So what we're going to do in this um, assignment is we're going to download this um, Firefly signal. Uh, you can get these signals right here off of the course uh, website. But we're going to take that and we're going to write a C program that calculates the real and imaginary components of the Hilbert transform. Then we'll use the ATAN2 function to compute the phase. We'll unwrap the phase. We'll compute the instantaneous frequency. It'll be kind of noisy and jagged, so we'll run the instantaneous frequency through another filter. In this case, it's a 301 point Gaussian filter. I will take a look at that. Then we'll save the instantaneous frequency. After that, We'll make a spectrogram of the original signal. We'll overlay the instantaneous frequency on top of the spectrogram to see if the um, instantaneous frequency matches up with the, uh, the components that appear in the spectrogram. And then there's a few other questions um, that ask you to plot magnitude and phase uh, of this Hilbert transform function. I'd like to make just a few comments. So. Um, if you go over to uh, MATLAB, um, let's, let's first take a look at the spectrogram function. Um, over here I give you some parameters. So I say use a 2 to the 12 point FFT, that's 4096. Use a Hamming window. Use 90% overlap. So how do, we, how do we account for all of that? Um, let's let's do, the, do it like this. Let's say n is equal to 2 to the 12. And then we'll say spectrogram x hamming uh, generates a hamming window of length n. We'll round 90% of the width of the window. Then we'll do an endpoint transform and we'll pass in the sampling rate. And when we do that, we get a uh, spectrogram of the signal that looks like this. We have time running up the vertical axis, frequency running across the horizontal axis. And let's see, the sampling rate is 44,100 hertz. So half of that would be 22, uh, what, 2250. Uh, so that's the highest frequency that appears in the spectrogram. If we look at, um, let's see, xlim, I'm going to just display the bottom 5 kilohertz of the signal. Maybe we display even less than that. Let's go to just 3 kilohertz. Um, we start to be able to see the notes that are being played here um, as the bright spots in the spectrogram function. Let me zoom in on a piece of this. Yeah, you can see the very first note that's played is this note, whatever that frequency is. Um, then we transition to this note. 
then up to this note, then back down again. If we knew how the notes corresponded to frequency, we could read <clears throat> this like a piece of music. Uh, let's see, uh, a few other comments here. Um, let's, let me make a comment about this Gaussian filter, 301 point Gaussian filter. You can generate that in MATLAB using the Gauss win function. Um, let's say 301 and the parameter is 2. Uh, let's plot that and see what that looks like. Um, that looks kind of like a Gaussian function. It's 301 samples in length. Let's see if we can figure out what the uh, magnitude response looks like. Um, <clears throat> so to do this, I'm going to plot, we'll do this all in one line, uh, 0 up to n minus 1 over n. That's my frequency vector. And I'm going to multiply that times the sampling rate so that this will be in units of hertz. Then I'll say, um, 20 times log base 10 because I want a magnitude plot in dB absolute to get the magnitude FFT of my Gaussian function make sure it's an endpoint FFT and there it is that will generate in one line of code the um, spectrum of the signal and it's sort of hard to see what this looks like, but um, first of all, let me make a comment. So on the x-axis, we have the frequency running from 0 all the way up to the sampling rate. Let me, let me make that plot again without uh, fs included in the, the equation, just so that we can see what's going on. <clears throat> so notice uh, this now is a, an approximation to the DTFT, discrete time Fourier transform where we have um, frequencies going from 0 to 1 instead of from minus a half to a half. So the positive frequencies are from 0 to 1 half and the negative frequencies are from, zero, from 1 half to 1. Um, if we wanted to plot things so that the frequencies were, were flipped, we could do it like this. <clears throat> we could subtract 1 half and then we could say FFT shift on this whole thing. And then we have um, we have frequencies going from minus a half to zero on the left. Those are the negative frequencies. Positive frequencies on the right. Zero is in the middle. And you can see now a little bit more clearly that this is in fact a low pass filter. So this Gaussian window filter uh, that we're using is a low pass filter. I think I have a block diagram of this. <clears throat> so yeah, our input signal gets processed through the delay filter with impulse response delta n minus n naught. So that's creating a delay. Um, here we have the Hilbert filter in the lower branch. What comes out are, should be interpreted as the, um, the real part and the imaginary part of the Hilbert transform. We feed those into a four quadrant arc tangent function and we unwrap that phase, calculate a first difference, <clears throat> and um, that gives us an estimate of the instantaneous frequency. But it's kind of jagged and you can make a plot of this and verify that for yourself. So to smooth out the rough edges on the frequency estimate, we're gonna run that through a Gaussian filter. And that produces an estimate of the instantaneous frequency that will be nice and smooth and everything looks good. Let me just make a few comments now um, on the um, filters that are present here. If you um, think about it, this filter, the delta n minus n naught, the Hilbert filter, these are both FIR um, systems that implement uh, convolution, and um, this Gaussian filter is performing convolution, it's a filtering operation, and also this first difference. We could we could build a filter that has an impulse response delta n minus delta n minus 1 and when we convolve the signal with this we're calculating the difference between adjacent samples and so <clears throat> again for one two three four of these blocks we can reuse our filtering code from previous lab exercise all we have to do is load in an appropriate impulse response in each case and save the output signal for processing 
by subsequent operations. So the only extra C code that you have to write for this lab is um, a four quadrant arc tangent and an unwrap function. I'll show you some results uh, when I did this lab. <clears throat> Uh, the blue line that you see here is the instantaneous frequency at, that comes out at the end of this process. Um, this would be for the firefly signal. Um, and if you listen to it, you can hear the, tr the uh, transitions to these different notes. Um, <clears throat> what I'm uh, displaying here, I'm, I want to note that I'm displaying this on a log scale frequency axis, which um, you know we hear, humans hear on a log scale. Um, I've also, in the, the red lines, represent notes um, that are in the regular, uh, regular notes. On the next page, I'm displaying these uh, notes again on a linear scale, a linear frequency scale, and then next to the red lines, <clears throat> I'm, I'm showing what the notes are. So, for example, this very first note is a B-flat, and then the second note is an octave up, another B-flat, and the third note is a D, natural. Um, and then we go back to the B flat, B flat, B flat. So a, th a, a three octave uh, step there. And then we go, um, anyway, so you can, you can kind of look at the notes as you process through this. So you could take this picture, walk over to a piano, and basically play this <clears throat> song. So um, all of that comes from uh, Hilbert transform, a uh, little bit of additional processing and extracting and filtering the instantaneous frequency. I hope you have a good time doing this lab.